uh, um, just wanted, I just want to start with prayer for this message, just that the Lord would express what he wants to share in this message, that the Lord's heart would come through, we would have ears to hear what he would have us to hear. And so, Lord, we just, just bow with me in prayer, or just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just tell you we love you, Lord. Father, we are asking you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon this message, that it would be exactly what, Lord, you're looking for, exactly what you want. I'm asking you, Lord, for the breath of life to come upon this message, Lord, and you would give us the ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Lord, we ask you for that in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I was praying about, okay, so here we are, you know, I'm sure y'all remember dad did an incredible message on the bride of Christ, and it was just so deep and impacting and just full of revelation and life. And so now we're, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the indwelling life of Christ. I'm actually writing a book about that and hopefully going to start teaching that in September. So I was praying, okay, Lord, from now, like July and August, what is it that you want me to focus on? What is it you want me to do on and in terms of a series? And I I just had this thought while I was praying is I love the, I don't know about you, I don't know if you like these or not, but I, I really love reading blog posts or listening to podcasts and someone says, okay, hey, what would you tell your 25-year-old self? You know, someone who's older like me, uh, what would you tell your 25-year-old self? I love those questions. And so at first I thought about that in prayer. I was thinking, okay, what would I tell, okay, I just turned 50. Okay, what would I tell my 25-year-old self? And the first thing I thought is like, I probably wouldn't say anything because I'm not sure he would listen. <laughs> I mean, I was so filled with pride and so filled with I know it all that I couldn't receive anything from anyone hardly. And so the, that was my first thought is like, if I shared it with my 25 year old self, I'm not sure I would listen. But you know, I worked through that and said, okay, if somehow I could get myself, my 25 year old self to listen, I said, okay, I want to write down what would I share in my, as f at 50 to my 25-year-old self to help them, to help me, and help you, hopefully, come up into my failures and my experiences so that you can learn and go further faster. That's kind of the theme of this message. And so, okay, I'm 50. I'm going to write down 50 lessons. Now, we're not going to do all 50 today. We're going to do them over about six messages. So you can relax, and so I'm not going to cover them all. So... But I just thought, okay, you know, it's, it's been said that a wise man learns from his mistakes. A wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. But the wisest of all learns from the, both the successful and unsuccessful experiences of others. And that's kind of what I want to do today is share just, okay, things I've learned in my pursuit of the Lord over, I mean, it hasn't been 50 years, but in, now that it's 50, just over these you know, I would say since I was for about 30 years, okay, what is it if I was going to say these are the most important things you need to focus on, focus on these things, what would I share? And, and that's really what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about. Proverbs ta says that in Proverbs 1.3, a wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. So you really can, listen, you can learn from anybody, even the fool. Even the foolish person, you can look at him and go, that's, not, that's what not to do. So a wise person doesn't know it all. And so I just want to hopefully, I, my, my heart in this is to hopefully help you, okay, I've done a lot of things wrong, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've learned some lessons along the way, hopefully share those with you to help you in your relationship with the Lord. That's the theme of what we're going to be talking about over the next six weeks. And so I've broken it down into different categories. Categories, you know, this, this, the first two messages are going to be related to your relationship with God. I call them first commandment lessons of things you can learn in your relationship with God. Your, the most important thing about your life is your relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the number one thing about your life. And so I'm going to spend about two weeks talking about lessons I've learned in my relationship with Jesus Christ to help you. And then I'm going to talk about different things like spiritual development, personal development, communicating, ministry, things I've learned along the way. So, you know, I, I really hope this, this really helps you out. But anyway, this message, we're going to talk about eight things, eight things that were related to your relationship with the Lord. And the first one I want to, I want to talk about is number one is master the spirit-led life. 
What would I say to my 25-year-old self? I would say, Brian, master the spirit-led life. Become an absolute expert of what it means to live from the spirit by the power of the, Holy, the indwelling Holy Spirit. That, I'm not going to say there's nothing more important there, but it ranks right up there of utmost importance. Understand how God created you. The Lord created you specifically to abide in him. The divine design of God in creating you was so you could abide in him. And if you don't know how he created you and you don't really understand the way he created you, and I'm talking he created you spirit, he created you soul, and I would add heart and body. If you don't understand that, abiding in him is a real mystery. But when you understand that God created you spirit, soul, and body so you could abide in him, so his life could flow from him in you outward, then abiding becomes so much more easy. And so I would say, make sure, Brian, you really, really understand about your spirit. Your spirit is the most important thing about your being. And make sure, Brian, that your spirit is the leader, not your soul or your body. Find out what that means. Find out what that means because that, here, that is where the abiding life begins. Understand how you were created. Make sure, make sure that your spirit is the strongest part of your being. Okay, when you wake up in the morning, your soul is going to be stronger. Your mind is going to be racing. Your emotions are going to be going everywhere. Your body is going to be craving. That, and if you don't make your spirit the strongest part of you, you are going to live from the soul. You're going to live from the body. But you want to make sure that the strongest part of you is your spirit. Therefore, you, got to, you must contend with God in prayer every morning that he would make your spirit the strongest part of you because the strongest part of you determines how you're going to live, whether you live from the spirit, the soul, or the body. So make sure you really get that. And make sure you understand the Holy Spirit the same spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells within your spirit. You are grafted spirit to spirit with the Holy Spirit. The same spirit who created the universe, the same spirit who impregnated Mary, that same spirit is now one spirit with you. You are grafted and joined to the Holy Spirit. No matter how you feel, no matter how you feel, well, I don't feel very close to God right now. Or I don't feel like I feel dead and I feel dry. I feel this or I feel that. And you're going to allow your feelings to dictate your relationship with the Lord. Don't do that. The truth of it is, is you cannot be closer to Jesus Christ than you are if you're born again. Because your spirit is connected to his spirit. And so what happens then is when you're feeling this way, it's a clear indication that you are living from your soul because the soul lives by feelings. Therefore, you need to renew your mind to understand that God dwells in you, Christ dwells in you, and therefore the feelings that are saying this, you're far from God, you're dead, you're dry, you're disconnected, he's a million miles away, those are lies. The truth of God's word says your spirit is joined to him, spirit to spirit. Meditate on that because renewing your mind is vital. Renewing your mind is vital. Your meditation determines your orientation, whether you live from the spirit, the soul, or the body. Understand the way you think determines the way you live. As a man thinks in his heart, so he will live. That is so vital to living from the Holy Spirit. And so I would say, go deep in that. And um, I would say, if you want to live in victory, 
You must live from victory. The victory that Jesus Christ won for you on the cross by his death and resurrection. That Jesus Christ says over you, you are righteous. You are crucified. You are dead. You are resurrected. And when you agree with what God says about you in Christ, that gives you the ability to live from victory instead of for victory. And I would tell myself, okay, living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. See, so many Christians say, well, I just want to, I just want to live for God. But God doesn't want you to live for God. He wants you to live from God. That might sound, well, that's just semantics. No, it's a vital paradigm shift to realize I'm not just going to go out and live for God and try to do all this stuff for God in my own strength and my own power. I'm actually going to live from the life of Jesus that is inside of me, and I'm going to live from his life and bear fruit from his life. Living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. Anyway, I could spend four or five months talking about that, and I will, because that's, sort of, that's the theme of the next teaching of Indwelling Life. I'm writing a book about that right now. Um, there's so much I could say about that, and I will say that for like four or five months. But I, anyway, just want to just say, the first thing I would say to myself, master, master the Spirit-led life. You want to go deep in living by the Spirit from the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing I would tell myself that I would share with you is build your life around your purpose and God's eternal purpose. Build your life around your purpose and God's eternal purpose. And if you, if you were to ask most Christians, what is God's ultimate intention? So many Christians would say to glorify himself, to make disciples in the nations, to save the lost, and though all those answers are, are not wrong in and of themselves, it doesn't fully convey the ultimate intention that is in the heart of God. And it is a, it is, Paul said it is a mystery. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul unveiled the mystery of the purpose that drives the Godhead and has driven the Godhead from the beginning of creation. In fact, inspired that cre the, the creation. And so I would say, make sure you understand that everything God does and is moving towards is based on his ultimate intention. Now, if you want to understand exactly what it is, you can, I'm not trying to do a plug for my book, I just don't have the time, it is the eternal blueprint. It goes through as a whole book about what is God's ultimate intention. But I would say, find out what it is. It's way deeper than, than salvation. It's way deeper than just God glorifying himself. Find out what God's ultimate intention is and build your life around it. Find your purpose in God's ultimate intention. So many Christians are trying to find their purpose. They're trying to find meaning for their life. They're trying to find out, okay, what does God want me to do? And they're always looking at this or that. But all our purpose really should come out of what is God's ultimate intention and what is my role in that. Find your purpose in God's ultimate intention, and build your life around that. Number three is I would say give your best energy and time to cultivating an intimate relationship with God. Give your best energy and time to cultivating an intimate relationship with God. There is nothing more important about your life than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Not your job, not your spouse, not your family, not your ministry, not anything you do or become. Nothing is more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about a religion. I'm not talking about acquiring Bible knowledge. I'm not talking about any of that, though, though, though understanding the Bible is important. What I'm talking about is your, your relationship with Jesus Christ, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is of utmost importance. 
And that, not only in this life, but for all of eternity. I'm convinced and from studying scripture that those who are going to be the closest to the Lord for all of eternity are going to be the ones who pursued him with all of their heart in this life and made him their first love. First love for Jesus takes hard work. I would say orient everything about your life around developing this relationship with Jesus Christ. Let this determine who you marry if you're not married. Let this determine your job. Let this determine your family and your influence and your ministry and every single thing about your life. Let this one thing of intimacy with God determine every single thing you do. Because you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight to maintain first love. And Jesus looked at the church of, uh, of Ephesus, and they did all these great things. They loved the truth. They were very strong in keeping the truth. And he said, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And if you have been following the Lord for any amount of time, you know how easy, how easy it is. Raise your hand if you know how easy it is. It is so easy to lose your first love. Life comes at you fast. Trials hit you, temptations hit you, busyness hits you, paying the bills hit you, you know, bombardment after bombardment. And so you look back two months later, three months later, you look and you look back and you realize, I have drifted from my first love relationship with Jesus. I didn't mean to, I didn't want to. Orient everything you do about your life around this one thing and let everything you do flow out of this relationship with Jesus Christ. Lay everything else down, put everything else on the altar, build your life around this one thing. Jesus told Mary of Bethany, he said she was pursuing intimacy with him. She was sitting at his feet, listening to his words. And the Lord said to, her, said to Mary, this one thing will not be taken from you. That's the one thing that cannot be taken from you. The Lord has ensured that this one thing cannot be taken from you. So I would say, orient your life. Build your life around it. Let your best time, what, what, what is your best time? Is it in the morning? Is it in the afternoon? Is it at, is it at night? When are, you, when are you at your best? When's your, when's your, most, when's your greatest energy level? Find out what your best time, when your best energy is, and, and block out whatever time is needed to say, okay, I am going to press in to develop a relationship with the Lord. And a relationship with the Lord is meant to be a conversation. It's not just to be, again, I, I love Scripture. You know I love Scripture. But it's not just to be like reading about a person in a book. Though we should and I'm going to tell you, it's one of my points, we should read about a person in a book, but a relationship with Jesus Christ is, is far more than reading about a person in a book. It's about a, a two-way conversation where you are communing with Christ. You are speaking to him. He's speaking to you. And you have a relationship. You're feasting upon him. You're hearing his words. You're expressing your words back to him. This whole thing is about a relationship. From the very, very beginning, God's eternal purpose is all about relationship. The very fellowship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had in eternity past, that, that very relationship they had, which blows our minds, we can't even comprehend, but that relationship they had where the Godhead was satisfied in God for all eternity, that very relationship, they said, we want to invite humanity into this relationship. That is just stunning. You have been invited to enter the fellowship of the Godhead with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can begin partaking of that relationship now because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Jesus said in John 17, he's, he's praying to the Father, and he says, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you and the one whom you have sent. 
Eternal life is not dying and going to heaven. Eternal life is not a place where you go. Eternal life is a person that you know. Eternal life is knowing God intimately, communing with him, fellowshipping with him, letting his life in you, possess you. That's what eternal life is all about, knowing God. So I don't know what all is going in your, on in your life, but I will say the greatest joy you can have is to know God. Develop that relationship. Cultivate it. It is, it is your highest calling. You, you know, I used to think, okay, my highest calling is to be an apostle or a prophet to the nations. And, you know, my highest calling is to travel around and prophesy over people. And, you know, my highest calling is to, you know, write books or my highest calling is this or that. And that's all just, you know, God, God definitely anoints people to do those things, anoints me, anoints you to do those things. But that's not the highest calling. First love is that highest calling. The very reason you were created was to love Jesus and to have a relationship with him. And that sounds boring to you. It just means you don't know who he is. <laughs> and I, I can definitely feel some of you going, oh, God, you're telling me, my, you know, you're saying that the greatest thing in my life is going to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. That sounds really boring. Well, that just means you don't know him. Because when you know him, when you really know him, and you, you, you behold the one John saw on the Isle of Patmos, where, where his beloved disciple, he was, he was the one known for leaning his head on the heart of Jesus Christ. He was the one who was closest to Jesus among the disciples. When John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, the brightness of his appearing, the, his face shining like the sun in his strength, knocked John the Beloved to the floor as if he was a dead man. And Jesus picked him up and said, do not be afraid, it is I. That he is the one we're called to know. And so if you think that knowing Jesus is boring, that just means you don't know him. I promise you, if you will reorient your life around this one thing of getting to know God, then you will find out he is way, way better than you could ever imagine. And his love for you is so intoxicating, there is nothing that compares to the love of God. There is no experience you can have that is greater than feeling the love of God. The experience of his personal, unique love for you as if you're the only person in the universe. That's the way he feels about you. He loves you with incredible love. See, you will be tempted to pursue other things above a relationship with God, whether it's your, a, a blessed family, whether it's a, a, a career, whether it's a ministry, whether it's something you do, whether it's you want to, you know, spend your life being entertained or doing fun things or whatever. Now, none of that stuff is wrong, but you will be tempted to place those things above your relationship with God. Don't do it. Fight against that temptation because if you lose first love, you lose everything and your light can go out. And you can be a foolish virgin whose lamp is being extinguished. So make sure you work hard at that. Number four, and this kind of goes along with that, that point, is work hard at being yourself and cultivating your unique relationship with Jesus. Now make sure you catch this, okay? Jesus loves you. He doesn't love you trying to imitate the most anointed prophet or apostle or worship leader or writer, author, or whatever. You just see this all the time. You see, I mean, I've seen it so often where you, you know, there's an anointed man of God, an anointed prophetic vessel, an anointed teacher, apostle, or whatever, and the people that follow him, you feel as if like you're talking to that person, and the Lord's like, no, I want a relationship with you, your unique self. I don't want a relationship with you imitating this other person. You know what I'm saying? 
I, I remember when, this is back when I was in my mid-20s, we had this man that would come. And I've, you guys know, I've shared about Jeff. Some of you remember Jeff Burke. But he was, he was the, to me, one of the most anointed prophetic vessels where he would know Un, I mean, unbelievable amounts of detail about your life. He would prophesy over you. It was just, it was simply stunning just watching him minister, just the, the, just watching people's faces and their mouths drop as he told them intimate secrets that no one know but them and God. It, it was really a stunning thing. And he would always, like, when he would prophesy, he would always rhyme a lot of times. He was the rhyming prophet. And so, I, you know, in my 20, mid-20s, 20 I was like, okay, well, I don't know. He, he knows God. He hears God. He rhymes and he prophesies. So I'm going to try to prophesy and rhyme. And, you know, it was a disaster. <laughs> don't try to be anyone else but yourself. And be happy. Jesus, wants, Jesus loves you as if you are the only person in the entire universe. See, Revelation, Revelation, 21, uh, Revelation 2, verse 17, talks about a, a white stone. I won't go into all the details, but it talks about a white stone that no one else is going to know the name that's written on that white stone except you and the Lord. I'm not going to know it. Your spouse is not going to know it. No one else is going to know it but you and the Lord. This tells us that Jesus has, Jesus has a unique, has created you uniquely to fill something or to touch something in his heart that no one else can do. You're going to be tempted to try to say, okay, I'm going to copy this person or emulate that person or I'm, I think, you know, it, they hear from God, I'm going to do what they did or whatever. Don't do it. Be yourself. Work really, really hard at being yourself and being happy in the way God has created you and in the relationship that he wants you to have with him. Yes, there are going to always be people that are more gifted than you. There's always going to be people that, that have more influence than you. There's always going to be people that can teach better, prophesy with more accuracy, you know, multiply the mission of God in the nations or evangelize or make money or influence people. There's always going to be people who are more successful than you are, but that does not mean or that does not devalue who you are. God wants you to be you, and God wants you to be happy in being you. Be yourself in your unique relationship with Jesus. Amen. Number five, go deep in the Word of God. Go deep in the Word of God. Now, what I would say is this. Go deep in the Word of God first, first to know God, not to know about God. Now, knowing about God is important, but knowing God is, is more important. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he says, you search the scriptures because you think in these scriptures there is life, but you're unwilling to come to me so that you might find life. These scriptures testify of me. All scriptures point to a person. So use the scriptures first and foremost to develop a relationship with God, to get to know God, to hear God speak. I heard someone it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was a cessationist kind of mocking charismatics, but he said, if you want to hear the audible voice of God, open the Bible and read it out loud. And I mean, it was kind of mocking people who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there, there is some truth in that. I mean, obviously, I believe God speaks for sure. But there is some truth in that, 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 that one of the primary ways God's going to speak to you is through his word. Get in the word to hear from God. Okay? Secondly, now, after you have built your life around that to know God through his word, secondly, go deep in the word of God and, and understanding it and getting mental knowledge. Sometimes people who want to go deep in the indwelling life of Christ discount the importance of really understanding the word of God. I'm not talking about understanding books in the Bible, understanding books like Romans, and understanding books like Ephesians, Colossians, Hebrews, Isaiah, Daniel, Revelation. Go deep in these books. Get commentaries. Read, 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 read. Study. Study to show yourself approved. Um, dig into Hebrew meanings and Greek meanings. And you think, oh, that sounds so boring. It sounds like Greek. No, 
you can't really understand the scriptures until you get into the language and the original language. Immerse yourself in that. I would say truly, from my own experience, one of the greatest transformations I've ever, I've, and I've received all kinds of prophetic words, prophetic experiences, heard all kinds of teachers and stuff like that. My greatest transformation is when I get into the scriptures and I immerse myself in God's word, you know, to know him, but also to really get into the scriptures. Okay, what is, what was Paul really trying to say? What does it mean to be justified, sanctified, and glorified? What does it mean when, um, when Jesus talks about his church, his body? What is the purpose of the church? And asking those kinds of questions, learning how to properly interpret scripture. Uh, I, you know, it, it's so, there's, there's no replacement for that. I, and I would say, start as young as you can going deep in scripture, okay? You will, you will, I promise you, you will not regret it. God says, my word will not return to me void without accomplishing all that I intended for it to do. God's word is not going to return void. I just look back at my life and I, you know, I made a lot of dumb mistakes in my, you know, to where I am now. One mistake I didn't make is I, I, I said at the very beginning, I am going to go deep in the scriptures. And I just look at it now and just be like, that was a wise decision. I, I've made a lot of dumb, dumb mistakes. That was a very wise decision. Go deep in the word of God. Number six, learn to recognize the voice of God. Yes, God speaks in his word, probably the primary way that he speaks. God also speaks in dreams. God also speaks in visions. God also speaks through other people. God speaks through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's, there's a lot of different ways God speaks. For me, what I would say, the, the primary way God speaks to me when it's outside of the scriptures, the primary way, I've had, I've had God dreams. I've never had a vision. I don't really get visions, but I've had God dreams. I've I've heard, you know, definitely prophetic words that were just spot on for me and, you know, different things like that. For me, the way that I hear God the clearest is in my spirit. And the way I describe it is your spirit has an innate ability from God to know things intuitively. And I've really been on this, this kick lately of, of doing a lot of research and hearing different near-death experiences and things like that, you know, vetting out which ones are legitimate and which ones are just not legitimate. But one of the things that always comes through in these near-death experiences is they always talk about in heaven you know things intuitively. You know things through thought transference where... It's not like right now where I'm speaking and you're hearing and you're processing and your mind's thinking and you're trying to understand and figure it out. Your spirit has this innate ability to know intuitively. And you can, you can, under, you can hear a lot of communication in heaven takes place through thought transference where you automatically just know things and thoughts are transferred from one person to another without anything expressing. People in heaven know your thoughts. That's kind of scary. <laughs> That's actually really scary. You wouldn't want to know what I'm thinking about you right now. Um, but people, I mean, that, that is really terrifying, that people know in heaven your thoughts and you know their thoughts. Um, I'm a pastor, so I'm not sure I want to know that. So, but anyway, my point is, is, is you have this ability in your spirit to know things intuitively, but you don't have to wait to die and go to heaven to experience that intuitive ability to commune with God. You have that right now. First Corinthians chapter two, Paul talks about that, is that your spirit, the Holy Spirit communicates with you spirit to spirit. He, he speaks to you and he, he, he brings in this whole analogy of the, he said, Paul said, you have the mind of Christ. That's staggering. You have the mind of Christ. Just like you know, your spirit knows your thoughts, you can know the thoughts of God because the indwelling Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And as you learn to recognize in your, in your spirit's intuitive ability, in your spirit's intuition, those things you know then you can begin to commune with Christ at a spirit-to-spirit -spirit level. And I would say to myself, okay, that is the, the primary way God speaks. Or not the primary way. After the word of God, 
that spirit-to-spirit communion is the primary way God is going to speak to you. Um, So I would say make sure you learn how to hear God's voice. Also make sure of this. Recognize that that if you're going to try to hear God's voice, make sure you understand your soul is going to masquerade for his voice. And it's very easy in this journey of learning to hear the voice of God that your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your thoughts, how you feel, whatever that is, your soul can masquerade as God's voice. And so you think that what you're hearing is God, but it's actually yourself. Make sure you understand that, okay? Don't let that scare you off, but make sure you understand it because now you can test out and say, okay, um, okay, this is what I think God's speaking. Is this my soul? Is this my own thoughts? Or is it from the Spirit? Do I know this intuitively by my spirit-to-spirit connection with the Holy Spirit? Or is this just my own thought? It could even be a great spiritual thought or a great uh, scriptural thought, but it might just be your own soul. Learn to make that distinction because the Lord told Jeremiah, if you can separate the precious from the worthless, then you can be my spokesman. Being God's spokesman, that begins, being God's voice, that begins by you making the distinction between that which is coming from the Holy Spirit, that which is coming from your spirit, and that which is coming from yourself and your soul. Learn to make that distinction. I would also say this, is God will speak to you through others. God will speak to you prophetically. God will speak to you through prophetic words that other people give you. But always, always, always take anything anyone else speaks to you back to God. And if God does not speak to you that and confirm in your spirit that this is from him, then just put it aside. You know, so many people have shipwrecked their lives building or, or, or acting on a prophetic word someone gave them. And the Lord's like, That wasn't even me that spoke. You thought it was me. You never tested it. That's why Paul said, test everything carefully and hold fast to what is good. You've got to test what people share with you. And if it doesn't confirm what God's speaking to you, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not necessarily God, but at least put it aside for a second until God confirms it with you. If God does not confirm it with you, then you know, get rid of it. If if anything God would speak through anyone, including yourself, that does not align with Scripture is not from the Lord. So test it, test it, you know, thoroughly vet Is this you or not you? Number seven, take God seriously, but not yourself. Very important. An old man who used to minister here, like a spiritual father to many of us here, he said, divine seriousness is the grand master key of spiritual progress. Divine seriousness is the grand master key of spiritual progress. And from, from, my, from my experience, I believe the church has lost the fear of God. Not everyone, but by and large, in much of the church today, The fear of the Lord is absent. There is is very little today of trembling at the word of God. And the Lord said through Isaiah, this this is the one I'm going to look at, the one who is humble and contrite and the one who trembles at my word. The fear of the Lord, we need to take God way more serious than we do. We need to fear, I mean, I, I mean, just, we need to fear him. And I don't mean be afraid of God, okay? So there's a difference between fearing God and being afraid of God. Fearing God draws you close to him because he know, you know that God wants to be in a relationship with you. Being afraid of God is withdrawing from him. So I'm not talking about being afraid of God. I'm talking about fearing him, that I, I don't want to miss what God wants me to do. I don't want to disobey him. I don't want to, I don't want any impurity in my heart. I don't want anything in my soul to get between me and the Lord. I want a pure heart. And that that fear of the Lord needs to drive us. You know, 
a lot of times people talk about that, you know, they, they, they think about, they talk about the difference between being under the law and being under grace. And they think, okay, well, I'm so glad I'm not under the law anymore because, man, that was really harsh requirements of what we had to do. But I, and, and I'm not, I'm very grateful I'm not under the, under the law either, but it's not because I don't, I think God's permissions and demands have become more lenient. I think they've actually gone way up. I mean, under the law, you could, you could uh, get away if you, had, if you had hate in your heart or unforgiveness in your heart but didn't murder someone, then you were not guilty of murder. If you went so far and even if you had lust raging in your heart towards another but you didn't commit an act of adultery, you, you, you were still under the law, okay. But in the, under the new covenant, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that if you have hate in your heart, you are a murderer. If you have lust in your heart, you're an adulterer. I find that to be way, the, the requirements go way up. God's demands in the new covenant are not less demanding and his permissive, permissions are not more permissive. Okay? God's grace, whatever, God's truth in the new covenant, it does not lower. It actually goes, the requirements go way higher. But now we get God's grace, which is his power that enables us to live up to what God's truth demands. So my point here is this, is, is a lot of talk in the church today is like, praise God, you know, we're, we don't, you know, basically o obedience has now become optional. And the Lord's like, no, no, not at all. Jesus said, if you want to abide in me, you've got to keep my commandments. The abiding life hinges on our obedience. So what, what my point is, we need to take God way more seriously than we do. We need to fear him. We need to fear the Lord. But I would also say to myself, I would say to you, take God seriously, but not yourself. You are a frail human. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know that. <laughs> You're a frail human. That is not an excuse so you can go live a, a license for whatever you want to do. You're a frail human. God knows the way you are. God knows your nature. And he loves you like he, you can't even imagine, even in with all of your warts and your hangups, all of your experiences. God loves you just the way you are. And so, you know, a lot of times people who have the fear of God, which, like I said, we need the fear of God. We need it really bad. People who have that fear of God tend to take themselves so serious that, that they do become so overly analytical. One bad thought. It's like Martin Luther. I don't know if you've heard about Martin Luther, but Mar during the Reformation, before he had a revelation of justification by faith, Martin Luther would go to these confessional sessions, and he would confess for like six hours to the priest. And... You know, he would say all these different things that he did, and he would say, oh, okay, I, had a, I just had a prideful thought during prayer. I confessed that prideful thought during prayer. Um, I confessed this bad thought I had towards my brother, and they, they say that the priest was like uh, hated when Martin Luther came to confess his sins. I'm not talking about that kind of a lifestyle. That will drive you, tor that will torment you. God does not want you to live that way, overly analytical, overly, you know, some people have called it being so... Um, you know, gazing and, you know, um, just gazing at all the wrong things, navel gazing, gazing at all the wrong things that are wrong with themselves. And usually it's, it comes from a good intention. You fear the Lord. You want to please him. You want to purify. You want a pure heart. So I would say fear God, but enjoy him. Fear God and enjoy him. And, and, and as you fear the Lord, enjoy your relationship with the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and trust the Holy Spirit to show you what's wrong with you. He's really good at that. <laughs> He's really good at showing you your faults, isn't he? I mean, if you know, you've been walking with the Lord for some time, you know he's really good at correcting you. But a lot of us, you know, a lot of us, you know, you think about it, we already know what is wrong with us. <laughs> a lot of us know what's wrong with us, but we don't really know what's right about us not because of ourselves, but because of Christ, because of Christ in us. And a lot of times the Lord just wants you to say to us, it's Christ in you. 
Yeah, I see you. You are a man and a woman of flesh. You are filled with pride and selfishness and fear and anxiety, and you have all these different issues and these hang-ups and these quirks, but I love you anyway. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't take yourself so seriously. Take me seriously and trust me to show you in my timing of what is wrong with you and how I want to correct you. Now, let's, let's turn in the scriptures here. I want you to see what Paul said. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. It's, pretty, it's a pretty amazing scripture. Paul is saying this. The great apostle is saying this. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. Listen to what Paul said. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Wow. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. See, as we fear the Lord and as we enjoy our relationship with God, you know, some people get so over-analytical about this little thing wrong or that little thing wrong or whatever here, whatever there, and, and they don't trust the Lord to show them and, and, and trust the Lord that He is your judge. You know, the thing you might want to correct, the Lord, the Lord says, yeah, I'm going to correct that, but in about six months or a year. Don't look at that right now. Look at this. So we want to be even spirit-led in our own personal evaluation of us and let the Lord be our judge. Take, you, take God serious, but not yourself. Enjoy your relationship with the Lord. Smile in his presence. And, and just realize that you are meant to enjoy God. And everything that flows out of you is meant to be this joy-filled relationship with Jesus Christ. Number eight. Do what God has called you to do, not what he has called others to do. Man, that's so important. This flows out of your unique relationship with Jesus. Do what God has called you to do, not what he's called others to do. Now, what makes me feel really good about this is Peter had the same struggle. You know, the Lord tells Peter, Peter, this is how you're going to die, John chapter 21. You're going to die this way. And Peter's like, okay, I'm going to die this way. Well, what about John? And the Lord's like, I'm not calling you to be John. I'm calling you to be Peter. I'm not calling you to emulate John. I'm calling you to be your unique self and you follow me. Whatever happens with John is none of your business. He's mine and you're mine. Do what God has called you to do, not what he's called someone else to do. You know, the old phrase, stay in your lane. We need to stay in our lane as it relates to what God has called us to do. I, and this one for me was, this has been a real struggle, just like, you know, just, I mean, it's not really now, but it used to be, you know, in my uh, 30s, like, okay, you see this anointed, successful man of God doing this, or this, uh, this man of God doing this, and they're having great success, and you're like, okay, oh, I need to go take what they're doing and copy them and emulate them. The Lord's like, no, you have a unique assignment. You have a unique assignment. I am going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ based upon the works you did, based upon what I had intended for you to do, not what I had intended for someone else to do. See, if you are living the life of someone else, you're going, to be, you're going to be, even if you do great works for God, you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's like, I never called you to do those things. I called you to do this. See, do what God has called you to do, not what he's called someone else to do. See, God has given us a unique vision. Our unique mission is to make the bride of Christ ready. That is, I mean, there's, there's many, many facets to that. There's many other things God is emphasizing to us. But at the very core, our mission is like what John the Baptist, his mission was to prepare, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist was a forerunner to make the people ready for the first coming of Jesus. Our mission 
in, in this church, in life school, in the forerunner school, all that God's called us to do is to make the bride of Christ ready. Now, there's not a lot of people out there that are talking about that, especially 20 years ago when, we, when the Lord started to first call us to this. We're like, okay, who's even talking about this? I don't see anyone talking about this. Okay, Mike Bickle's talking about it. Um, I don't see anyone else talking about it. Thankfully now, a lot of other people are talking about this. It's becoming more of a, more of a emphasis. But you know, when, when back then you're like, okay, are we doing something wrong? Because not a lot of people are focused on this. And, and you know, you ha the Lord was just like, no, stay in this lane I've called you to stay in. You, you do what I've called you to do. Don't do what this person's called to do or that person's called to do. You, out of your unique relationship with Jesus Christ, you stay in your lane and you do what I've called you to do. And, and that's what the Lord is going to judge us on. It says in Ephesians that he has works prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Those works that he calls you to do are going to be the basis of his judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Did you do what I called you? you to do. Not what I called this one to do or that one to do. Did you do what I called you to do? Stay in your lane. Don't worry about John, Peter. You follow me. Don't worry about this ministry or that leader or this church or that church. You follow me in the way I have called you. Amen. Amen. So we'll bring it to an end there. And so now we only have 42 more lessons to learn. So, and plus more bonus ones. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just pray that you would let these things really sink in. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would give us wisdom in this, Lord. Give us your wisdom, Lord. Give us your wisdom, um, I pray, Lord, that we would grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Lord, give us your wisdom. Give us your heart, I pray. Give us your insight, Father. Train us and teach us. Lord, I pray that you would really help us to be ourselves in your presence and to be content in who we are in our relationship with you, not trying to be anyone else, Lord. I pray for that in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just pray that you would just truly fill our hearts with your presence and teach us and train us to live by your life, Lord. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We can go ahead and end the online.